So today I want to talk about trustworthy federated learning. And this might for some look like a, one of these soft skill topics uh, because it's not about optimization. It's not about algorithms, but actually I would consider this uh, the core, one of the core or most important lectures of the whole course. And one reason why this is so late, this, this lecture is because it's not my, uh, my home turf, so to say. I'm an, I'm an engineer. I'm more interested in, 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 in statistical properties and uh, optimization uh, models for federated learning. But in the end, what we, what we do in federated learning, we want to have apps. Uh, I want to have, uh, we want to have services that, that serve somebody, serve somebody. And this somebody is typically a human. And so we should be worried mostly about humans. So this is today we put the, the human user into the center of our attention and also into the center of our design choices because if you if you remember uh in in federated learning we have several design choices so first of all we we can choose what we consider as data so we have these local data sets this could be flow measurements traffic flow measurements could be uh sensor outputs of air handling units so it's a design choice up to you we also have a design choice for the for the network structure. Ultimately, it's a design choice. You can, of course, use fancy mathematical tests or statistical tests, which look very much uh, uh, advanced. But in the end, it's you who decides if you want to use a, a, a kolmogorov smirnov test to find out if there should be an edge or not. It's a, de a human design choice in the end. Uh, yeah. and. Overall, in, in our design principle, if you remember in a previous lecture, I presented this uh, generalized total variation minimization as the federated learning design principle. So this is the, the analog of empirical risk minimization for basic machine learning. And in federated learning, we look at the, at the special case, uh, a special case of, of models. So in particular, we consider models that assign a hypothesis to each node of an empirical graph and we measure the discrepancy between the hypothesis maps at, at neighboring nodes. So this, this term here is the, the generalized total variation. And we could interpret this as a, as a loss term. We could interpret this as a specific choice for a loss function, or we could also interpret this as a specific choice for a hypothesis space, because um, as I pointed out in a previous lecture, adding such a term adding such a term, which is also sometimes called a regularization term, is um, equivalent to putting constraints on the hypothesis maps. So instead of adding this uh, penalty term, uh, there's an equivalent formulation. So solving this optimization problem is equivalent to a constrained optimization problem where we don't have this term, but we have constraints. For example, the constraint that uh, the hypothesis at node one, uh, why uh, must not be too far away from the hypothesis at not J using some measure of, of distance. So this must be smaller than some number eta, another parameter which is related to this parameter. So what this uh, adding this GTV term does is essentially uh, pruning the model. So this, this term here is also, uh, is equivalent to a choice of, of hypothesis space to a model. So we use a specific type of model in federated learning. And this model comes from the network structure of the data. Okay, but the bottom line is there are several design choices. And after you have done the design choices, you, op you solve this optimization problem. How, how could we solve this optimization problem? Do you remember any optimization algorithms that I mentioned in the previous lectures? gradient descent, in particular federated gradient descent, but this you can only apply if, if this whole objective function is differentiable. Uh, if it's not differentiable, in particular, if you also have uh, mixtures of different models at different nodes. So at some nodes, you have a, a decision tree, which is non-parametric. So there is no gradient, or it's not obvious how to define a gradient. Uh, which other optimization algorithm did I present in the course? Relax, yes, federated relax, which is uh, a fancy name for co block coordinate minimization. 
block coordinate minimization algorithm. Yes, so these design choices have to be made by us. And how do we guide? What, what guides these design choices? Well, in the end, a first criterion is, of course, uh, a validation error. So we, we, we come up with design choices uh, for this GTV minimization. Uh, we, we solve it using either gradient descent or relax, some relax algorithm. And we get what we get out of these algorithms is uh, a hypothesis for each node. So one learned hypothesis for each node. And how, how do we know if this is good? Well, we try it out on a validation set. So we validate it on a validation set and we have a, vali a separate validation set for each node because we want to learn personalized models, personalized hypothesis maps. So we get a, a validation set. And if we're unhappy with it, uh, we must repeat this cycle again and change a bit. Change, uh, for example, use different edge weights, use different edges in the empirical graph, uh, or change the loss function. Okay, so beside the, the, the validation error, which is what I call statistical aspect. So in this triangle, the statistical accuracy is uh, what is measured on the validation set. What we also have is uh, computational complexity. So we want to we we don't want to uh, have optimization algorithms that run on a on a supercomputer for three weeks. So this is the uh, this is the second criterion from a technical perspective. So the computational complexity. This is the the second corner here in this triangle in this uh, design guide guidance triangle. Statistical accuracy and computational complexity. So there's one question here. Uh, the question is, when is GTV or generalized total variation not differentiable? Yeah, when is it not differentiable? For example, when you use a discrepancy measure for parametric models, you use the, the norm, for example, the Euclidean norm. So each, each uh, hypothesis map is characterized by a, a parameter vector and you measure them by, you measure the discrepancy by the norm, by the norm. And this is not differentiable. There's a corner when the, the difference is zero, is the zero vector. It looks like this. So it's here, it's not differentiable. Okay. Does anyone have a, have a suggestion how to save the basic structure of gradient descent for, for such a non-differentiable function? Is there a simple extension or upgrade of gradient descent? Is there a, a, a gradient descent version two that can all, also handle such non-differentiable functions? Yeah, pr projected gradient descent we use when we have explicit constraints on, on the model parameters. Like we, we put the, the constraint, like the norm must be smaller than two or something. Then we can use projected. But let's take, uh, let's uh, ignore any constraints for the time being. And we just look at the, the objective function. So when it's not differentiable, is there some something more general than a gradient that we could use? Yeah, we could use a brute force uh, search, all possible values, but something that is somewhat similar to a gradient. Yes, very good, very good, very good. Uh, the subgradient, so the subgradient could be used. So we could use subgradient descent, but I did not cover subgradient methods at all. So this was a very good comment from one uh, very much math uh, savvy student. Okay. So, yeah, just to, to re repeat two main aspects from an engineering point of view, and this is, so to say, my home domain. This is where, where I do research, is uh, study how accurate can we get methods or what are, are methods that uh, achieve a high accuracy and how can we develop methods that have minimal computational complexity. 
So this is my main research domain. And recently I started to research another uh, design aspect, which is the trustworthiness. And this is the main uh, theme of today's lecture. So the question then is, <clears throat> Uh, how can we measure trustworthiness? Uh, we can measure, we can measure statistical accuracy, uh, as I said before, using a validation error. So we compute the average zero one loss, or a classification error, a, a classification accuracy on a validation set. We can measure this. We can also measure computational complexity. We can measure computational complexity, for example, by uh, measuring the the runtime of an algorithm that you that actually you have to do now also in this current quiz for graph learning. So we can also measure this, but uh, how do we measure trustworthiness? And I will point out some ideas how to measure it. Uh, and these ideas, they have been uh, formulated recently by, um, by a so-called high level expert group on AI, which has been uh, constituted or has been organized by the European Union. And they, prepared a document called the ethics guidelines for trustworthy artificial intelligence. And what I like about it, it's uh, stating a few key requirements, seven key requirements. No, seven is not too much. It's less than 10, a bit more than three, three main components of machine learning, but um, seven is still also manageable. So we, we will now walk through it step by step. By the way, can you still see my slides? Just checking, not that I talk. Very good. Okay, so without further ado, the seven key requirements for trustworthy AI as postulated by the European Union are first, human agency and oversight. Second, technical robustness and safety. Third, privacy and data governance. Fourth, transparency. Fifth, diversity, non-discrimination and fairness. Sixth, societal and environmental uh, well-being and the seventh key requirement is accountability. Yes, uh, it's really, an, uh, really encourage you also to have a look at this document. So it's freely available uh, on the website of the European Union. I have put the link here and I highly recommend to read through it. Okay, let's, and now I will go step by step, uh, briefly discuss what, what, what is meant by these key requirements. So this is mostly what I will do today is, is citing. So that's an easy job for me today as teacher because I just cite or refer to text that has been prepared by the European Union. But I will also give some glimpse and this is really, this is really the most uh, uh, open part of my course. So there is also not much available yet, not much research. I mean, uh, when I talk about computational complexity, I can uh, rely on 50 years of research on gradient descent on bounds of uh, how many iterations does gradient descent need to converge to some accuracy. But here is not much. So this is really a, a, a new, new territory for many of us. Uh, okay, so the first requirement is human agency. And there it states, the overall principle of user autonomy must be central to the system's functionality. Key to this is the right not to be subject to a decision based solely on automated processing when this produces legal effects on users or simi similarly significantly affects them. So how we can take this into account in our design choice as well, we should not use certain labels. So remember, the ultimate goal of machine learning is to, to learn a predictor or a hypothesis that allows to predict something. Uh, and we might then not be not allowed to use uh, certain labels, certain choices for labels, like the label could be, is this per person guilty? or something and and this this label might be used to to immediately execute <laughs> execute uh, the 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 sentence so there should always be a, a human in the loop in this case so there must always be some human judge for example to over overlook this whole process but we could we could minimize the risk here uh, right from the beginning right from the start when we design a machine learning system that we do not choose certain labels that we do not choose uh uh for example uh, the the label would be would be an indicator if a, a loan or a credit should be granted to a person like in banks banks use uh, as features your your history your work history 
uh, as features to characterize you and then predict. So is it worth credit? Is this person worth a credit or not? And uh, yeah, it, this should not be used completely unsupervised by a human. Yeah, please interrupt me anytime. Uh, I would like this lecture also to be very interactive to get your input and hear your opinions. Yeah, then another requirement is the human oversight. And here I want to point out that uh, the main point to bring in or to enforce or to, to implement human oversight is already when we do the design choices. When you decide what is the loss function, how do we measure that a predictor is good? <laughs> what What is the, the local data sets that are used to define the loss function? What, what is the network structure? These are all design choices. And here you bring in the human oversight. Okay, then there is this uh, concept of the human in the loop, which refers to the capability for human intervention in every decision cycle of the system, which in many cases is neither possible nor desirable. So why, why is this uh, sometimes not possible? Well, a decision cycle could be could mean a gradient descent step, for example, a gradient step to, to improve or to, to, yeah, to improve the weight vectors, the parameter vectors for the, for the hypothesis maps. And these gradient descent steps, they run on very high speed, so within a few microseconds. And that's why it's not possible to have a human checking each gradient descent step. Because after all, that's why we have machine learning methods for that we do not have to to find the best parameter vector on uh, using pen and paper, but having some gradient descent method. So in this case, it's not possible. However, there are different different time scales for this decision cycles. There there might be also a validation time step or validation cycle and. These validation errors, they should be analyzed by some humans. So this is also what I require you in the in the Federated Learning Project report, that you compare the validation and the training error of the of the trained models. And there you bring in uh, the human in the loop. Based on, on this comparison between validation error and training error, you change the model, for example, which is also a decision. So in this decision cycle, in this uh, slower decision cycle, you can bring in the human. But typically not in the in the fastest cycle, which is uh, gradient are the gradient iterations you do to optimize uh, like the weights of a deep neural network. Okay, then there's the notion of human on the loop, uh, which refers to the capability of human intervention during the design cycle of the system and monitoring the system operation. So this is also closely related to uh, the human doing the design choices and uh, the human looking in uh, comparing validation and training errors. So monitoring systems operations. Okay. Uh, yes, then there's the concept of human in command, which refers to the capability to oversee the overall activity of the AI system, including its broader economic, societal, legal, and ethical, ethical impact and the ability when to decide and when and how to use the system in any particular situation. Uh, do you have an example for an AI system where this broader impact was uh, detrimental and uh, had then to be stopped or counteracted? Do you know of any example where the broader impact was really detrimental? Yeah, self-driving cars. There, there's a big broader impact uh, uh, because it might reshape uh, how we organize our infrastructure and uh, the legal basis. I mean, the legal basis for, for uh, car traffic is 50 years old or maybe older, some hundred years. So there might be... Uh, Big changes how we how we regulate the the what happens on on the roads with self driving cars. Another example that comes to my mind would be a personalized recommendation or personalized advertisement, particular uh, in social networks during elections. So there were this uh, 
claims that certain elections have been have been influenced or heavily influenced by <clears throat> by social networks. Um, on the other hand, I'm, I'm wondering which which election ever in the history of humankind was never influenced using some media. So, but that the speed and the accuracy with how how this is possible, this influencing and targeting people, this is different now. Okay. Next requirement is the technical robustness and safety. So with this requirement, I, I feel most convenient because there's the word technical. And since I'm a technician, so this is where I feel most home. This is now the easiest game for me. Uh, so here it states the, the recommend or the, the guidelines state that AI must cope with changes in operating environments or pre a presence of other agents, human or artificial, that may interact with the system adversarially. Uh, so there are these examples of, of uh, image processing. Uh, deep neural networks that uh, detect image uh, objects and images, and you can fool them by just flipping one pixel. These are called one pixel attacks. So, and the, the problem here is that this, uh, you, you have learned a hypothesis using a deep neural network that behaves very regular, very regular, but just for one specific change, it changes completely the behavior. Uh, so this is the input feature, and this is the, the output of the neural network. So what you would like to avoid then is that that you can, do not learn such uh, very uh, abrupt changes, hypotheses that have such abrupt changes, but are more smooth. So do you know how we can favor to learn uh, more smooth hypothesis maps? Which uh, techniques do we use to to avoid learning such irregular hypothesis maps? or unstable maps. What machine learning techniques do we use to avoid learning uh, very rapidly changing function? Yes, regularization. So this can be ruled out using regularization techniques. Might, regularization might avoid this, learning such networks that can be attacked by flipping one pixel. Uh, then something more specific for uh, federated learning is in federated learning, we, we use uh, we use data from strangers because by its definition, federated learning means you, you use fragmented data sets, distributed data sets that you have not generated yourself typically to train models. So who tells you that this data set, one of these data sets is artificially or intentionally manipulated? That the, the algorithm that then runs like federated stochastic gradient descent produces a specific hypothesis that this attacker has in mind and knows what it will be and exploits this information. So we'll talk about this in more detail next week in the lecture on data poisoning attacks. But roughly speaking, the defense mechanism is again using regularization techniques. Yes, so uh, one way to, to study uh, the, the reliability and the kinds of the sensitivity of the AI system to changes, to small changes in, in, in input data is by by generate uh, by estimating uh, what is called the variance, estimator variance. So you randomly select training sets, uh, different training sets, and look how much does the learned hypothesis change when you use a slightly different data set. And then you want to, to prefer, or you prefer machine learning methods that have a, a small variance. So that do not depend too much on, on the precise shape of the training data, but rather always uh, produce more or less the same hypothesis for all possible data sets. Okay, and then there is uh, pointed out uh, the, useful, the use of a fallback plan. So when you find out that your method is not very stable, so it, it, it seems to be highly sensitive to small changes in the training data, for example, 
then you it would be good if you have a fallback plan. So you you then uh, switch back, for example, from a, a, a deep neural network to a simple rule-based procedure, which could be a decision tree. So rule-based procedure here means uh, machine learning model being a decision tree. A shallow decision tree. OK. Yes, then, uh, then there's the mention of when occasional occasional inaccurate predictions cannot be avoided, it is Im important that the system can indicate how likely these errors are. A high level of accuracy is, is especially crucial in situations where the AI system directly affects human lives, like when it's predicting the steering angle of a self-driving car, which is driving at the speed of 100 miles per hour. Then you should have really good idea how accurate your predictions are. And one way to get the measures of confidence for this for this accuracy is, um, for example, in logistic regression. Remember, in logistic regression, we use a, a linear hypothesis map to predict the label by just checking if it's larger than zero or smaller than zero. But we can also use the absolute value of uh, or the magnitude of this hypothesis map to get an, uh, a measure for the confidence in this prediction. And if this confidence measure is small, then we might say we do not trust this prediction at all and we must use some fallback plan. Okay, any questions at this point? Okay, then I continue with the next key requirement for trustworthy AI, and in particular trustworthy federated learning, which is privacy and data governance. So again, in federated learning, we, we use the data from somebody else. And before, so previously we said the risk could be that this somebody else might intentionally uh, tune the data such that we get a certain behavior. But on the other hand, we, we could also, we could be the, 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 the nasty one. So we also don't want to, or the other one doesn't want to share private information. So it, it should be uh, in a privacy friendly way, uh, this whole learning process. And uh, just to remind you in federated stochastic gradient descent and this federated relax algorithm that you can also find in section nine of the lecture notes, at no point there is raw data exchanged. So there's no uh, uh, data points from these local data sets ex exchanged, but only we only exchange uh, gradients or uh, what they are essentially uh, parameter vector updates between them, or we exchange predictions uh, on a test set. So we, we train here uh, a local model, which gives a hypothesis at node i. And what we exchange then with the other node is the, the predictions of this hypothesis on a common test set. This is what is revealed. But at no point, we at, at no time we share raw data. And this is one, one of the was one of the main motivations for federated learning as a field uh, when we use uh, medical data. So each node here could represent a healthcare provider and has as local data set a patient database. So you you do not you are not allowed also uh, for legal perp for legal reasons to share raw data between these two healthcare providers. Okay, and uh, we will also talk more about this privacy preserving feature learning or privacy preserving learning uh, methods next week in a lecture. Uh, just to give a glimpse, the idea could be, for example, to to directly learn new features for each data point that uh, are useful for the quantity of interest. So here the quantity of interest would be the, the food preference. So each data point here is characterized by two properties. The, the food preference uh, prefers apple or prefers pizza and the gender. So either male or female. And let's say for a data point, we, we do not want to share if this data point is male or female. So the, the gender would be the sensitive or the private variable, uh, but uh, the food preference is, is not sensitive. This, um, this is the, the thing that we want to predict. So we could then uh, just use as features the food preference 
uh, and not the, the gender. So in, in this case, when, when the data set looks like this in the original feature space, this means we, we project onto this direction. So let's call this direction D and we project the, the, the data points in the original feature space X1 and X2 on this direction that indicates the food preference, but maps all data points uh, with the same food preference, but any gender on the, to the same point. So this would be one way to, to transform the features of a data point to privacy preserving features. And we could then even share these, these features. Uh, yes, so an, another aspect of, of data governance is to be aware of um, error or, or the, the integrity of data. So uh, when you gather data, you may uh, also include some um, imperfections which are errors or mistakes, which arise from a, a model mismatch. So you might define a data point, for example, as being uh, a, a temperature, a certain temperature that is measured by a, a sensing device. But uh, the actual value that you get is never exactly the temperature, but only up to some variance or, or error tolerance. So when you look at a, a data sheet, for a temperature sensor, you will always find a specification of the typical error range. So the, the label values that you have then in hardware that you read in in your data frame is always uh, containing a bit of noise. And this amount of noise is characterized, for example, in a data sheet. Yeah, by the way, this reminds me, if you're interested in using hardware in, in your project, please let me know on Slack. Uh, we might be able to organize uh, you some hardware, in particular a Raspberry Pi boards, if you want to do a federated learning project with hardware. Okay, then uh, there are recommendations to have uh, data protocols, to always uh, document who has access to which data and in what circumstances. And for example, uh, this is implemented in GitHub. So in, when you have a GitHub repository, you can add members, you can uh, change the role. So the type of access they have, and you can also uh, define the, the time period of access. Okay, any questions uh, regarding privacy or data governance? Okay, so next key requirement is transparency. And here the, the guidelines say uh, the data sets and the processes that yield the AI systems decision, including those of data gathering and data labeling, as well as the algorithms used should be documented to the best possible. And this is what I also ask you to practice in the, in the Federate Learning Project. This is exactly what you do when you write the report and write down what is your definition for data points, what is the definition for labels, how do you get the, the data and the labels or the data source, which algorithms did you use? So this is uh, necessary to ensure traceability. So it's not uh, a painful exercise for, for this federated learning project, but if you then work as a machine learning engineer, no, you might be writing a lot of this documentation because it's one, a uh, key requirement for trustworthy AI, which is traceability. Another requirement within uh, transparency is the explainability of uh, an AI system. And for this, we, we at the moment, we don't have really a clear definition what, what is a good explanation. So an explanation is uh, roughly speaking, anything that allows the user to predict the behavior of the machine learning method. So. An explanation is, for example, when I teach you how federated learning algorithms work. So this course, this whole course is one way to explain, is one explanation, a very sophisticated, uh, large and lengthy explanation of how federated learning systems work. And after you completed this course, for example, you should be able to explain, uh, you should understand an explanation of a federated learning method 
in terms of what are the local data sets, what is the empirical graph, uh, what are the local models, what are the local loss functions. So after this course, each one of you has this basic knowledge to understand an explanation in this form. But of course, there are many people who didn't take my course. And for this, for them, such an explanation is not so helpful. They, they do not know how to uh, come from, from a choice of local data sets and local models to an understanding of how the algorithm behaves. Yes, so explanation is always uh, something subjective. It it's, must be tailored to a specific user with a specific background knowledge. And uh, also there are two different types of explanation. So one explanation is uh, explaining a whole federated learning method. So this, this explanation should give a uh, uh, kind of, should open up the, the principles that are used to, to turn raw data, like local data sets into hypothesis maps. So this should explain really the whole learning process. Another type of explanation is to ex explain a particular prediction. So a particular uh, point prediction for a certain data point. So a prediction uh, could be, uh, a number like in regression problems and an explanation could be the prediction is obtained since we use a linear hypothesis and the weights for this linear hypothesis are 10 and 4. Once you get this explanation you can reproduce the, the prediction of the model or of the hypothesis uh, more precisely. Yeah one popular form of explanation or what is often considered an explanation is also a decision tree uh, and a learned decision tree. So a decision tree for which we know all the, the thresholds in these tests. Such a decision tree is considered an, an explanation for a, a prediction. Yes, so regarding this transparency is also uh, required or the, uh, the transparency also requires that AI systems should not present themselves as humans to users. Humans have the right to be informed that they are interacting with an AI system. So, the, for example, on Slack, uh, the Slack bot is always indica indicating himself or herself as the Slack bot. It doesn't uh, pretend to be some person like Alex. Okay, so that was the requirement on transparency. Next requirement is called diversity, non-discrimination and fairness. So here we, we must ensure the avoidance of unfair bias. So the data sets used in AI systems, both for training and operation may suffer from the inclusion of inadvertent historic bias, incompleteness and bad governance models. So this is related to the choice of local data sets. So the local data sets, for example, should include uh, should include uh, each, gr uh, each group of a whole population. Like when you want to make predictions for uh, healthcare, then you should have at least the same ratio of, of male and females, also from different age groups, uh, just to not leave out a specific group of, of humans. Yeah, and uh, one example um, that I would like to sketch to ensure fairness is by data augmentation. So let's assume you have a, you have a, fed, a machine learning method that predicts the salary or the salary offer for a position and you feed it with some training data using persons for, for which you have the, the offered salary already. And there you might ensure fairness by augmenting each data point by just flipping the gender. So leaving all other features of the person like previous education, work history, and so on and so forth untouched, but only change the gender of the person. So then you want to ensure that the, the gender does not have an influence on the offered salary level. Okay, another requirement here is AI systems should not have a one size fits all approach and should consider universal design principles addressing the widest possible range of users following relevant accessibility standards. So uh, this refers to the, the human 
user interface. And what I would like to point out here is this nice feature of, of browsers to allow translation. So for example, for me, this allows now to access Finnish newspapers. Without this translation service, so without this ma machine learning service, I would not be able to access certain news media in Finland, unless I learn Finnish. Okay, uh, then another requirement here is, uh, or another suggestion is to, to solicit regular feedback even after deployment and set up longer term mechanisms for stakeholder participations. So you could have then regular uh, review meetings of, of the designers of the federated learning system. And yeah, essentially you, you should collect and manage feedback from the user continuously like you see often in, in restaurants or in cafeterias in Finland with this review uh, buttons. Okay, we are approaching the end. So the next requirement is societal and environmental well-being. Uh, here we should uh, make sure that we use as, as minimum uh, as a small resource or uh, we minimize the resource usage and energy consumption during the training. And this, for example, is related to this technical uh, aspect of computational complexity. So we want to we want to use federated learning systems that uh, require as little computation as possible. Uh, then another requirement or another aspect is the social impact. While AI systems can be used to enhance social skills, they can equally contribute to their deterioration. This could also affect people's physical and mental well-being, and the effects of these systems must therefore be carefully monitored and considered. So this might be related to, to choosing speci specific labels, quantities of interest, like uh, Huh. the risk of, of getting addicted to an app. You would like to predict this, and based on this prediction, you might limit the, the usage time of, of apps. Yes, another aspect here is the society and democracy uh, <clears throat> relation to, to or federated learning effect on society and democracy. Uh, the use of AI systems should be given careful consideration, particularly in situations relating to the democratic process, including uh, ele electoral context. So during, during elections, you might uh, forbid uh, to use specific labels. So not to, to use uh, as quantity of interest the, the, uh, political, the political sentiment of a person, or the, the level of how much the person can be still uh, persuaded about a certain political party. So you might just forbid such uh, uh, machine learning tasks or machine learning uh, models. Okay, the last one is accountability. And here uh, it, the guidelines uh, list that mechanisms sh should be put in place to ensure responsibility and accountability for AI systems and their outcomes, both before and after their development, deployment, and use. So this accountability includes auditability, which is uh, that the evaluation by internal and external auditors and the availability of such evaluation reports can contribute to the trustworthiness of the technology in applications affecting fundamental rights, including safety, critical applications, AI systems should be able to be independently audited. So this, this relates to the, the access. So when, whenever there comes, a, let's say, a, a government, somebody from the government and, and checks your AI system, then you should be uh, having ready available the access to, to your training process or uh, documentation, like a federated learning project report uh, that somebody else can audit your, your system. Okay, then uh, next requirement here is the minimization and reporting of negative impacts. So due protection must be available for whistleblowers, NGOs, trade unions, or other entities when reporting legitimate, uh, legitimate concerns about an AI-based system. The use of impact assessments, both prior 
two, and during the development, deployment, and use of AI systems can be helpful to minimize negative impact. So in this regard, I would like to point out that now Finland has established a formal whistleblower channel. So whenever you work at the public uh, organization, you have uh, now a channel, I think it's a website, where you can share your concerns. In Finland, we also have trade unions. So also trade unions might be important to, to provide a, a validation for the use of AI systems on, on a broader uh, scale. Okay, and then in uh, the accountability is also mentioned trade-offs. So uh, the relevant interests and values implicated by the AI system should be identified and that if conflict arises, trade-offs should be explicitly acknowledged. And this is uh, uh, sounds, sounds good, but it's, it's uh, subject to current research. So one of my research themes is, uh, for example, on the, on the trade-off between explainability and accuracy. So is there an intrinsic trade-off? And yes, there is. Uh, that guides how much uh, do we need to sacrifice in statistical accuracy in order to have uh, explainable machine learning methods. So it's possible to, to make these trade-offs precise using probabilistic models. Okay, so to wrap up, uh, in federated learning, we use specific design choices or many design choices for data model loss functions and algorithms, which algorithms we use. Uh, these design choices are often for engineer, for an engineering perspective based on computational aspects. So we want to have efficient algorithms which need uh, as little computation as possible. And we want to have methods that are as accurate as possible. So the statistical aspects are important. However, and I, would, I want to emphasize this again. In the end, the human user is the, the main component of a machine learning AI system. So this trustworthiness is actually the most important criterion from the human perspective. So we must uh, put the human first when we design uh, federated learning systems. And in particular, I have discussed seven key requirements for the trustworthiness of such federated learning systems. And uh, yeah, it turns out there are intrinsic trade-offs between these different aspects. So there are trade-offs between the computational statistical aspects and trustworthiness, and we should uh, optimally use or, or try to achieve these trade-offs. Okay, uh, thanks for your attention. And are there any questions at this point? Okay, no questions. So uh, I would say let that sink in and remember my words. Uh, although it's it's a bit late in the course, this topic, but I, I consider this trustworthiness the, the most important aspect of federated learning nowadays, in particular applied federated learning. And if you have a good understanding of this, uh, this regulation and these requirements, then this is very worthy for, for the job market in particular, because I see more and more companies are now really interested in having trustworthy AI, because for example, there are banks and they are categorized as high risk applications uh, in, the, in the draft for this new AI Act. And there are legal obligations to, for example, document their design choices for data model loss. So what you now learn in this course about documentation might be uh, a main tool in your future job. Okay, thanks a lot. And uh, do not hesitate to ask questions on Slack and by email. Otherwise, see you next week. Bye.